Symposium members, my name is Megan McCauley. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Director of Membership at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. I'm so excited to join you all today for our presentation on Madame de Pompadour at the Legion of Honor, Power, Patronage, and Portraiture. Before we begin today's program, I'm pleased to introduce our three speakers who will be joining us momentarily. Martin Chapman is interim curator in charge of European art and curator in charge of European decorative arts and sculpture for the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. In this position, he has organized many exhibitions and accompanying publications, most recently East Meets West, Jewels of the Maharajas from the Altani Collection in 2018, The Sculpture of Auguste Rodin in 2017, and Houghton Hall, Portrait of an English Country House from 2014 to 2015. In the Legion of Honor's permanent collection, he spearheaded the renovation of the Salon Doré from the Hotel de la Tremoya between 2010 and 2014. Isabella Holland is curatorial assistant of European paintings at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. She received her master's degree in the history of art from the Courtauld Institute of Art, where her dissertation focused on art and education for the working classes in Victorian London. Thomas Wu is curatorial assistant of European decorative arts and sculpture at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. He received his master's degree in the history of art from the Courtauld Institute of Art, where he wrote his dissertation on the thematic decoration of 18th and 19th century Sevres porcelain dinner services. Following the presentation, Martin, Isabella, and Thomas will take audience questions in a live Q&A, so I definitely encourage you to submit your questions throughout the program in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll take questions directly from there at the end of the program. And I'd also like to note that for optimal viewing, we definitely recommend entering full, full screen mode on your computer. This can be found on the top right hand side of your Zoom screen. All right, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you all so much for being museum members. And without further ado, please welcome Martin Chapman. I'm Martin Chapman. Thank you, Megan, for the introduction. Madame de Pompadour was a central figure in the arts in mid 18th century France, who helped promote Paris as the center of luxury and taste, a character that we still associate with French culture today. As mistress to King Louis XV, she was a major patron and promoter of the arts in France. She was the patron of French painters such as Francois Boucher, who painted this portrait and would paint Pompadour a total of seven times. She was also the patron of the architect Ange Jacques Gabriel, who upheld the continuing French classical tradition in architecture with projects like the Place Louis Gains, now the Place La Concorde, and I show you here a slide of one of the buildings there, the Ministry of the Marine, designed by Gabriel in his noble and sober form of French classicism. For the luxury trades, she was actively involved in supporting the Vincennes, later Sèvres, porcelain manufactory and French decorative arts in general, uh, executed uh, usually in the Rococo style, such as the tiny writing desk that we see at her side, beautifully designed with sinuous lines and expensive materials for the comfort and convenience of a more intimate lifestyle. In her role as Saloniste, she participated in the Enlightenment discussions through her connections with Voltaire and the Philosophes, and she actively supported the publication of Diderot's Encyclopédie, the encyclopedia that was slightly controversial in um, uh, court circles. Born into a family of privilege, Jeanne Antoinette Poisson was given her extensive education that laid the groundwork for her future role as patron of the arts. Charming and beautiful, she was nicknamed Renette, Little Queen, for the prophecy that she would fulfill as mistress to the king. The rich tax collector, Le Normand de Tournem, who paid for her education and is thought to have been her father, broke at her marriage at the age of 19 to his nephew, Charles Le Normand d'Etiole. In her married state, Madame d'Etiole from 1740 attended famous Paris salons where she sharpened her wit. 
when she started to hold her own salons, uh, she included major intellectual figures such as Voltaire. When the king was hunting near her chateau south of Paris in 1744, the beautiful Madame d'Etiole was able to attract his attention. In 1745, she attended the ball at Versailles where the king designed, where the king disguised as a yew tree declared his affection for her. And we see an image of the yew ball here on the right. Within a month, she became the king's mistress, was installed in private rooms above his at Versailles, and in a very short time, she was separated from her husband and was also given privileges such as the title of Marquise de Pompadour and preferments for her friends and family. This included her garden, her, this included her guardian, Le Normand de Tournem, who was made director of the bâtiment the most important role for royal patronage in the arts, not only in architecture, but also for painting and sculpture. And we'll hear more of that later. When de Tournon died, she made sure that her brother, Abel, Marquis de Marigny, was put in this position, meaning that she could continue to exert influence over architecture and the arts. Pompadour made herself essential to the king's daily life, amusing him when he became easily bored with entertainments and becoming gatekeeper for access to the king. In this role, she became almost as a prime minister, working with ministers and ambassadors. She would be instrumental in switching France's alliances, resulting in the Seven Years' War between 1756 and 1763 also known as the French and Indian Wars in the, in the Americas. It was disastrous for France, with the loss of her American colonies and rendering the country nearly bankrupt. Her role as patron was, however, much more successful. We'll hear more sh shortly about her patronage of painting and the Vincennes Serre porcelain factory. This elaborate Serre vase shown here made for Madame de Pompadour around 1760 is recorded on her, the chimney piece in her bedroom. It's a masterpiece of the Rococo style, uh, designed uh, with a fluid form with brilliant colors, including the pink, which was known for Madame de Pompadour. It's a potpourri for scenting the room and shows the type of highly designed and executed luxury goods that she favored. For architecture, she built or continually refurbished no less than 15 residences that she had with the king, from the Elysee Palace to the jewel box like Petit Trianon at Versailles, and we'll hear more of that next. Thank you, Martin. My name is Isabella Holland, and I'm going to be discussing a quartet of paintings directly related to Madame de Pompadour's patronage of the fine arts, Carl Van Loo's Four Art Series which has been in the museum's collection since 1950. Now hanging at the Legion of Honor in Gallery 7, the series depicts allegories of the four arts, painting, sculpture, architecture, and music. Here you see, and I have to admit bizarrely, very precocious children, almost many adults, engaged in very advanced creative pursuits. Beginning a painting, chiseling away at a bus, performing a musical composition and in the middle of constructing a building. The series was commissioned by Madame de Pompadour around 1752 for her newly completed residence, the Chateau de Bellevue. And in architecture, you can see a plan for the facade of the chateau. Conveniently situated between Paris and Versailles and overlooking the Seine, the Chateau de Bellevue was the only personal residence that Madame de Pompadour had built from scratch. It was considered the most intimate and modest of her many residences, which often consisted of existing structures that she purchased and refurbished through the support of Louis XV and the French state. Construction began in 1749 and was undertaken by architects employed by Louis XV, Lacheronce the Younger, in charge of the building, and Garnier Dille, who designed the gardens, where you can see people promenading about in this engraving. Unfortunately, Madame de Pompadour was a very short-term tenant and she had to sell the property back to the king in 1757 due to debts. 
It was used by the king's daughters after his death in 1774 and ultimately demolished in 1823. While we often associate Madame de Pompadour and her patronage with Francois Boucher, who also fulfilled commissions for the Chateau de Bellevue, she supported many French painters of the era, like Carl Van Loo. While little known today, in his time, Van Loo was a very well-established and well-connected in the Ancien Regime art world. He came from a family of artists of Dutch origin, and he studied art in Italy, then considered the epicenter of artistic education and creation, and upon his return to Paris in 1734, he was made a member of the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, eventually becoming the first painter to the king in 1762 and director of the French Royal Academy in 1763. One of my favorite subjects, the French Royal Academy was established by Louis XIV in 1648 as a royally backed institution that promoted the study, production, and exhibition of the fine arts in France. The Academy hosted a biannual public art exhibition known as the Salon, which displayed the latest works created by elected member called Academicians. Before its installation at the Chateau de Bellevue, the four art series received its public debut at the 1753 Salon. At the time of the exhibition, the royal official in charge of the Salon, known as the Director General of the Bâtiment du Roi, was the Marquis de Marignet, the brother of Madame de Pompadour, whose portrait is on the left. It was through her influence that he assumed this position in 1751, an extremely important role in devising and supervising the artistic agenda of France. He is also credited for revamping the academy during this tenure, in addition to overseeing public building programs, the royal residences, and royally backed manufacturers of the decorative arts like Gobelin. At the Salon of 1753, the four arts was very well received, and I've included a quote from the Abbé Leblanc, a member of the clergy, as well as an art critic, who would write summaries of what was displayed at each Salon. These four paintings are executed with lightness of spirit, but the elegance and nobility that predominate are indicative of the playful spirit of a great man. To me, the inclusion of the four arts at the Salon where it was lauded indicates that the allegories were meant to be admired and valued for their painterly innovation, reflective of the latest and greatest in French art making of 1753. It was also known that the series was intended for the Chateau de Bellevue and commissioned by Madame de Pompadour, therefore enabling others to see the paintings before their more private and perhaps more decorative placement at the Chateau. The Salon venue advertised Madame de Pompadour's excellent patronage of the fine arts and that her patronage aligned with the cultural endeavors and priorities of the French state, in addition to showcasing the artists, taste and style she preferred and supported. After this smashing debut, the works were installed in the Salon de Compagnie or the drawing room at the Chateau. You can see a plan on the right with the Salon as one of the bigger rooms and it was one of the most public spaces in the Chateau where Madame de Pompadour played host, guiding conversations about current affairs of the state with guests like Voltaire. Additionally, Van Loo provided two other paintings for this space, allegories of tragedy and comedy seen at the left which now reside in Russia at the Pushkin Museum. Even in her own time, Madame de Pompadour was known as a wit, essential for one to maintain power at the French court. Her education was appropriate for her, a woman of her upper middle class standing, and one of her supporters, the Abbe de Berny, remarked that Madame de Pompadour had all the graces, all the freshness, and all the gaiety of youth. She danced, sang and played comedy marvelously well. No agreeable talent was lacking in her. She loved letters and the arts. There are many Madame de Pompadour fans on the internet where I found this mock-up that shows a potential placement of the four art series, as well as tragedy and comedy within the paneling in the Salon de Compagnie at Bellevue. This of course is not an exact replica. However, we can imagine the series literally embedded into the Salon as playing witness or even serving as inspiration to the discussions about art that may have transpired in the room. 
the salon was an extremely important space for Madame de Pompadour to present her persona to audiences. The placement of the four arts within the salon shows the prioritization of her own image with the process of creating art, affirming her identity as a proponent of contemporary French art to her guests. It is important to understand the architectural relationship between the Van Lowe's and salon space and the museum's recently required, acquired two, two preparatory drawings of the four art series, painting and music, that indicate the original form that the paintings may have taken. These drawings show that the series was originally encased in a shield-like shape. There is a slight difference between the two shapes here, suggesting a reworking of form. The canvases were restructured in its history, perhaps to look more like a traditional painting, but if you're actually in Gallery 7, you can see the original shield outline. Coming back to the series and their direct connection to Madame de Pompadour, many scholars have speculated that the female figures depicted in painting and music may be her. On the left, in music, musicians in Renaissance era clothing, again, Italian art was all the rage during this era, take a break from playing the violin and viola da gamba to listen to their companion play the harpist chord. Madame de Pompadour was known to have played the instrument, and therefore, if it is supposed to be see her, we see Madame de Pompadour herself as a performer. On the right-hand side, we see the female figure, the same one, acting as a muse for a painter who has an apprentice seated nearby, therefore, there's this generational influence. And in these, in these two instances, the female figure is cast as a participant in the creative process. However, we don't see this female figure in architecture and sculpture, and there seems to be a gender division in the arts. And architecture and sculpture were professions that women were barred from during this time. However, Madame de Pompadour's identity is referenced. A sculptor is at work on a bust of Louis XV, and the architect is at work on a plan for the Chateau de Bellevue. We're given a private tour of artist studios, behind the scenes access to where art is made and is ultimately facilitated by Madame de Pompadour. Madame de Pompadour was interested in art making herself and in 1750, around the same time as the construction of the Chateau and the Four Arts, she created a series of etchings for close acquaintances. In the Met, they have, Dutch, they have etchings done by her after works by Boucher. And I wanted to highlight these particular etchings because they show children, perhaps a subject which interested her and which we kind of see in the four arts, kind of these good humored, healthy children. Boucher taught her how to etch, demonstrating that Madame de Pompadour had a very close relationship with artists and was interested in their practice. Madame de Pompadour clearly identified with allegories of the arts throughout her lifetime. This is a painting Van Lowe executed for Pompadour's brother, the Marquis de Marigny, on her deathbed. While we don't see Madame de Pompadour represented, the arts are shown supplicating on her behalf to have her life spared. You now see women represented as the arts at the bottom right, painters, musicians, and even etchers, and they've grown up since the original four arts, with the fates and an allegory of the world at the top demonstrating Pompadour's commitment to the arts until the very end. It is amazing that we have works in the Legion of Honor's collection that are directly tied to Madame de Pompadour's identity as patroness, coming from the Chateau de Bellevue, a location for which some of the most important commissions of the 18th century were made for. Thank you very much for listening, and I now pass it over to Thomas. Thank you, Isabella, and good afternoon to our audience. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, once again, my name is Thomas Wu, and I will briefly discuss the influence that Madame de Pompadour had on the production of porcelain in France. Uh, another object in the collection that relates to Madame de Pompadour is this Turin and stand produced at the Vincennes factory circa 1754 to 1755. It matches a description in Madame de Pompadour's inventory and is believed to have belonged to her. More specifically, it is a poa e, named for a Spanish meat and vegetable stew called Oya Podrida, that had been introduced to France by the consort of Louis XIV, Marie-Thérèse of Spain. Here is an example of modern Oya Podrida. 
Pua'ai are distinguished by their circular shape, whereas tureens for other soups are more often oval. As Oya was introduced to France during the 17th century, when silver still dominated royal and aristocratic tables, the shape of porcelain Pua'ai were likely derived from silver precedents, like this example made by the eminent silversmith Thomas Germain in the early 1740s. During the 18th century, formal meals were served in a manner known as service à la française, in which all dishes are set on a table at once for a sumptuous effect. The table plan on the right, taken from a contemporary manual on staging banquets, illustrates how a table might have been set. The plates forming the outermost tier of the arrangement correspond to the number of diners, while the inner tiers are comprised of shared serving dishes. In the case of a larger banquet, the center of the table might have featured an elaborate sculptural centerpiece or surtout, while in the case of a more intimate meal like what we see here, a serving dish like a poa a would have occupied the center. As Madame de Pompadour probably hosted on a more intimate scale, our poa a may well have figured quite prominently in her table arrangements. During one dinner at which Vincent porcelain was used, she proclaimed that one is not doing one's duty if one does not buy this porcelain. Madame de Pompadour purchased some 2,000 pieces of Vincent Sauve porcelain, but she is also one of a few prominent 18th century women who not only commissioned individual works of art, but who patronized an entire industry. During the early to mid 18th century, to rival porcelain imported from China, porcelain factories emerged across Europe and competed fiercely to produce the truest, highest quality porcelain. Of these, the Meissen factory near Dresden in present-day Germany was one of the first to master true, hard-paced porcelain. In 1740, a factory was established within the medieval Chateau de Vincennes, pictured here, with a loan from Louis XV. Early Vincennes wares were heavily influenced by Meissen's aesthetic of translucent pigments on a white or light-colored ground, which was in turn inspired by Chinese wares. In the early 1750s, Louis XV's patronage saved the factory from financial ruin, and Madame de Pompadour became increasingly involved with the enterprise. In 1756, the factory was relocated to a renovated glass factory in Sèvres, near her Château de Bellevue, and was then known as the Sèvres Manufactory. Finally, it was purchased outright by Louis XV in 1759 and became the Royal Sèvres Manufactory. However, as our dates to 1755 at the latest, it was probably produced at the original site in the Chateau de Vincennes. Madame de Pompadour's increased patronage coincided with the tenure of Italian-born goldsmith Jean-Claude Chambellon du Plessis, who designed Archerine as artistic director of Vincennes Sèvres from 1748 to 1774. Their guardianship resulted in some of the factory's most iconic Rococo forms, such as the Popuri à Bateau, the iteration on the right belonged to Madame de Pompadour and is today displayed in the green drawing room at Buckingham Palace. What was it that set Vincent Sèvres porcelain apart? As Cowlin clay, a key ingredient of true hard paste porcelain, was not discovered in France until the 1760s, the Vincennes factory produced an alternative, highly malleable soft paste with an exceptional capacity to absorb rich pigments allowing the deep, vibrant, and opaque grounds for which the factory became renowned. Thus, a failing proved a strength, and mid-century South porcelain diverged from Chinese and Meissen influence and conformed to broader European artistic movements. Arturine's bulbous body, scrolled feet and handles, floral decoration, and carefully modeled lemon, leaf, and flowered knob conform strongly to the Rococo style, characterized by curves and copious natural ornament. An intriguing example of porcelain aligning with other art forms during the mid 18th century can be found within our collection. The sprigs of colorful flowers or bouquet d'attaché that decorate the white ground of the Turin and stand were one of the most popular decorative motifs on Vincennes Sèvres wares during the 18th century. They also appear on the white silk dress worn by the Duchesse de Narbonne another alleged mistress of Louis XV, in this recently acquired portrait by François Hubert Drouet. The Poa Oeil can currently be found in Gallery 9B and Madame de Narbonne in Gallery 7, and I encourage you, our members, to view both with this connection in mind when the Legion reopens. 
With that, I pass the baton to Martin, who will conclude our presentation. Thank you all very much again for attending. Thank you, Thomas. I'm going to talk about uh, Madame de Pompadour and her legacy through this cup and saucer made by the Serve factory in 1778. Um, it shows the continuing influence and legacy of Madame de Pompadour made 14 years after her death. This is a highly sophisticated and collectible product of the factory, which was by this point enjoying worldwide recognition for the design and the execution of its wares. No longer struggling against the competition from the Meissen factory in Saxony, as when Pompadour first supported it in the 1750s, Serb now reigned supreme. Its wares were sent all over the world as diplomatic gifts, and each royal foreign visitor to Versailles received a gift of a dinner service or a suite of vases, further ensuring its reputation abroad. The cup is decorated with a dark blue ground color, which acted as a foil to the rich gilding, which is worked in great detail with scroll work from which are suspended garlands of flowers. The main panel on the front of the cup is painted with a scene of music taken from one of the paintings by Van Lowe of Madame de Pompadour's Chateau de Bellevue. Although painted some 25 years earlier in 1753, the pictures still held up as models for showing the best of French painting. The scene was probably taken from a print after Van Loo by Fessard, but given a new palette of colors, um, we, as we can see by comparing the two here. The saucer, on the other hand, was the invention of the painter Dodin, who was the leading painter at Serve and who had worked for pieces made for Madame de Pompadour, such as these vases at the Getty, made for her about 1760. Dodin's talents lay in invention, and here we see wonderful chinoiserie scenes on these vases. For the saucer, he's come up with a design that continues the theme of the scene of the cup. And for this, he's conceived the scene of a room after the children had gone out to play, leaving the musical instruments behind. A charming conceit that would only be uncovered by the drinker when they put the cup to their lips. It's not exactly the same room, but it's a complementary composition that conveys the aftermath of the children's activities. So to conclude, after ceasing her intimate relationship with the king in 1750, Madame de Pompadour was given an honorary status as, quote, friend of the king, unquote. This role of fidelity was symbolized in her portraits by dogs. She was allocated a grander suite of rooms at Versailles on the more prestigious ground floor where other members of the royal family lived and raised to the higher title of Duchess. The last architectural project commissioned by the king for her was the Petit Trianon, started in 1762. It was designed as a modest, modest and intimate retreat in the Parc of Versailles, where she could continue to entertain the king. Designed by her favorite architect, Ange Jacques Gabriel, in the balanced and restrained classical style that would become synonymous with French architecture, but she died before it was completed. For this last slide of Madame de Pompadour, we, uh, she's portrayed in the last year of her life by the court painter, Francois Hubert Drouet, as a grand lady of taste and influence. Dressed as a matron with her cap, she's working at her embroidery frame. She has emblems of her interest in the arts all around her. The bookcase behind her for literature, at her feet is the mandolin for music. A portfolio of prints and drawings, perhaps her own etchings. And the work table beside her is designed in the latest neoclassical taste, mounted in gilt bronze with ram's heads and garlands, showing that she was still in the vanguard of fashion and taste. She would die of tuberculosis when this portrait was being finished at the age of 42. Voltaire, who was 70 at this date, wrote, I'm very sad at the death of Madame de Pompadour. I was indebted to her and I mourn her out of gratitude. It seems absurd that while an ancient pen pusher, hardly able to walk, should still be alive. 
while a beautiful woman in the midst of her splendid career should die at the age of 42. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll invite our speakers to turn on their cameras and microphones here for our Q&A. If you are watching and you have questions, please do go ahead and put them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I will be keeping an eye on our chat box. And I think we already have some questions to start. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with the first, which was submitted prior to the, to the event, which was how did the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco come to obtain some of the pieces belonging to Madame de Pompadour? Um, I'll answer that happily by accident. Oh, really? <laughs> so it's uh, not necessarily intentional. These are uh, these fortuitous acquisitions that uh, from more recent research have turned out to have belonged to her. So uh, this is why this program is interesting, I think, for our members, because it hasn't always been known that some of these objects were associated with her. Interesting. I have to add, the Van Lowe's have quite an interesting history before the lives that many of the artworks have lived before they entered our collection, but it went with Madame de Pompadour to Paris. It was inherited by her brother. And then actually in the 1930s and 40s, the Nazis um, took the Van Lowe's from the Rothschild family, but it was act and put in a salt mine in Vienna, but it was actually restituted back to the family. And therefore we required it long after that restitution process happened. Fascinating stories. <laughs> With the whole Monuments Men, it is interesting to make those connections as well. Absolutely. Wow. Okay, people are really excited. We have some really great questions in the chat. So uh, one question actually is about Madame de Pompadour's education. And I was curious about the same thing um, during the presentation today. It seemed that she very clearly had quite the high level of taste and, you know, an incredible knack for arts and culture. Can you speak more, is more known about her education or how she kept her taste so refined? Well, it's known that it was uh, the education was paid for by um, the man who is uh, who is thought to have been her natural father, um, and therefore it was an expensive education. And he was a very rich tax farmer, fermier général. Um, so she probably had a better education than she would have done otherwise. Um, so, but she, w but it was a very full and broad education that gave her the groundwork for her role of, as a, a, a patron of the arts. Did Louis share her taste in the arts? Is one question here in the chat. Was this shared with the king? That's difficult to say because there's not really that much known about the king's actual taste. The trouble is that if you're a king, you're very often given, you have all these people around you giving you taste. The people <laughs> who, are, who are working for you are supplying it. The architects, the designers um, are all, uh, but there is probably a certain amount of it. But, but perhaps it is important to stress that it was Madame de Pompadour who would have been influenced influencing the taste that the king had around him in the private departments of Versailles. Mm. Following the same thread of questions about Madame de Pompadour, um, there are some questions about her, her influence um, and whether or not it extended outside of uh, the arts, as well as her relationship and the importance of her brother. Do, we, do you know anything about that? Could you speak to that? Well, well I, I, you go ahead. Um. Well, I will just speak to the latter part of her brother, but her brother, the Marquis de Marigny, who actually inherited some of her art collection after she died, was made the, um, the director of the Bâtiment du Roi, who was in charge of not just the buildings of France like Versailles and the King's own architectural program, but really setting an agenda for the art. So she must have, it was through her influence that he assumed that position. And it was actually a very important role. So I can see that having that brotherly and sisterly connection, she must have been completely 
um, interested in the future of French art. And it was kind of enabled by her brother, probably like as a man able to have a more official position in that role. Fabulous. All right. I'm going to switch tracks slightly. And we have some questions, particularly about the porcelain that was uh, shown earlier. So um, one of the first questions is, um, can you speak a bit to the connection between Sevres and Meissen and why, why or if one became more prominent than the other? Certainly. Um, I would say that the connection was essentially that they were rivals during the 18th century. Uh, the Meissen Manufactory was founded in 1710 um, in the town of Meissen near Dresden in present-day Germany uh, by Augustus the Strong, who was the elector of Saxony and king of Poland. Um, and about 30 years later, in 1740, um, the manufactory at Vincennes was founded to compete with Meissen. Um, and these were only two of many factories across Europe that were attempting to unlock the key ingredients to true, what they call hard paste porcelain, resembling porcelain coming from China and Japan. And uh, Meissen was initially the most successful. It was the first to um, uncover the secret and, and produced hard paste porcelain using a material called Kaolin clay. Um, Sev actually adopted a different paste called soft paste without that key clay ingredient, um, but that allowed them to um, be quite innovative in terms of richly colored grounds and it allowed them to develop a very different style that um, I believe took porcelain in, in quite a different and very European direction. And that may be why Sèvres gained an edge during um, especially the second half of the 18th century um, and was in high demand across the continent um, from England to Russia. And did Sev continue manufacturing porcelain for a, a long time? Is, there, is France still manufacturing porcelain? Yes, both Sev and Meissen exist today, actually. Um, oh, wow. Sev had a very long and interesting history. Um, the French Revolution um, was, a, was a considerable disruption in its production, but during the 19th century, it was really revived under Napoleon and began to produce really exquisite neoclassical um, and Egyptian inspired services for Napoleon's imperial court um, and continued to produce porcelain through the, the end of the 20th century. Yes. Another person has asked, how do they get the copies of the paintings on the cups and plates and other porcelain items? The, uh, it, for the cups, it was um, essentially copying from prints. And we think that the prints by Fessard after uh, the Van Loo paintings were used by the painter as the form. And then the painter has introduced its own, um, Dodin has introduced his own palette of colors. We don't actually know whether he saw the original paintings, but the point is it's the, uh, the medium of the print uh, that uh, gave the painter the model. For the um, uh, for the decoration of the cup. I see. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Um, I do have some more questions about uh, Madame de Pompadour and her sort of cohort. One question is, um, you know, we mentioned uh, Van Lo a few times. Did she have other artists in her orbit that she commonly worked with or knew? Isabella. Well, I think probably the most famous is Francois Boucher. Um, that is definitely one that comes to my mind first, just for executing. Um, there's this actually lovely painting in the Met that was made for Madame de Pompadour's dressing room. It's kind of this allegory of Venus made by Boucher for her. And I think I kind of love that idea of Boucher teaching her how to etch and having this investment, both of them kind of really knowing one another um, on an intimate scale. So there are many, but it's blanking, but Boucher is definitely what comes to mind is she seems to have a very vested relationship in the artists whom she supported. That's fabulous. I had another person who asked and remarked on uh, her, her clothing, her good taste in clothing. Do you know if she happened to be also involved in designing her wardrobe or does, does that come up in the research about her? 
Uh, I don't know, I'm afraid. We might have to ask someone in our costumes and textiles team yeah. at another time. Um, so another question that we have here is about the Van Lowe series, the four art series. Um, was it com was it co a common style to paint figures as children in adult like scenes like we saw here today? It was. I think Madame de Pompadour quite enjoyed this style. And I think that there has been scholarship that shows that Van Lowe might have been kind of the first to innovate the use of these almost many adults in kind of creative pursuits. I think of them almost as pooty, kind of like mischievous little babes who are looking over um, the people who are in the salon talking about art. But I also think that Boucher used um, this kind of motif of having children engaged in the arts. And the Frick actually has a series of works that depict allegories of the arts and sciences executed in around 1760 that shows this and it might have actually been commissioned from Madame de Pompadour. So she was quite consistent in the imagery that she surrounded herself in. And she also kind of supported artists who had these like innovative um, uses of art that drew from Italian precedent, but kind of revived for this new French aesthetic. Did she have children of her own? She did, but I they they died early. Oh. <laughs> Alexandrine, yes, beautiful like she was as a child. Hmm. Someone also asked about uh, Madame's untimely death and asked, was it unusual among the aristocracy to die from tuberculosis, or were many similarly afflicted? I think it was fairly universal tuberculosis until the 20th century and the invention of penicillin. I don't think it was restricted to one class <laughs> or another. I think it was a, a, a universal disease. Um, another question about Madame's collection. So upon Madame's collection, I, there was a note that Marigny, her brother inherited uh, much of her collection. Did Louis inherit anything? Was that known? Uh, not that, not that I know, but of course the the chateau would have gone went back to the king. Uh, the ownership of the uh, chateau went back to the king. The fifteen chateaus. So, and uh, I think Isabella talked about the fact that uh, Bedview had to be sold to pay for her debts because she was quite, um, um, I wouldn't say extravagant, but she spent an awful lot and she had to pay for her debts. Thank you. Um, all right, one question, one more question here. Would the panelists mind sharing their each respective interests in Madame de Pompadour and her connections to the arts? How does this fit within your respective areas of specialization? Um, would you mind speaking to that? And maybe Thomas, you could begin, Certainly. put you on the spot. Um, yes, and I, I can quite easily answer that. Um, my MA thesis was on um, the decoration of Sèvres porcelain dinner services and as one of the major patronesses of Sav, um, Madame de Pompadour is hugely relevant to my area of interest. Um, and, uh, and I think Sav really became um, one of France's most important industries during the 18th and, and especially the, the early 19th centuries. And um, that is very much her legacy. And uh, I think it's remarkable that during the 18th century, um, there were prominent women um, who not only uh, patronized individual objects, individual commissions, but entire industries. Um, so, so yes, I, I think uh, she is quite quite important to my to my area of interest. You mentioned that there are. Um, well, I'll let I'll let Isabella and Martin ask, answer first, please, and then I'll follow, follow up question. Well, carrying on Thomas's last thought, I'm really fascinated by the idea of female patronage and really the idea of what um, women are collecting and the artists that they're supporting, which again kind of ties into my study of museums and kind of precedents for collection. And I'm really fascinated by studying the intervention of women in the arts and kind of having unofficial roles when they don't necessarily have the legal power, but can really execute power through the arts in making their own image and supporting their image and other artists. So that's always been a fascination of mine. And for me, it was the fact that she's a major patron in decorative arts, which is my area. Uh, in the mid 18th century. Um, we also had an exhibition, I think some 
14 years ago on the Petit Trianon, which um, uh, started, of course, with Madame de Pompadour. So there have been many reasons to come back to her as uh, a major figure in uh, French culture in, and art in the mid 18th century. The follow-up question I had, and I think perhaps Isabella and Thomas, you can both speak to it, and Martin as well, you're of course welcome, was that you all mentioned um, female patrons and that they, you know, that Madame de Pompadour, while the one we're speaking about this evening, was not alone in that. Um, are there other female patrons, other female collectors who are represented in the, the Fine Arts Museum's collections, or uh, who are the other great female collectors and, and where can their collections be seen? In a way, there are um, other other 18th century um, female patrons represented in our own collection. Um, perhaps the two best examples that I can think of are two empresses of Russia who were contemporaries of Louis XV. Um, the first was Empress Elizabeth, and I'm afraid the exact dates of her reign escape me, but um, she it was she who founded Russia's Imperial Academy of the Fine Arts, Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture. And um, it was during the reign of Elizabeth, as well as her um, eventual successor, Catherine the Great, that um, both the production of steel furniture at the Tula factory in Moscow um, uh, began, and also Russia too um, participated in the, the competition to create porcelain manufactories, and there was the um, the imperial manufactory in, in uh, Russia as well. And we have examples in our collection of both Tula steel, which is quite rare, and, um, and of um, porcelain produced um, in imperial Russia. So, so yes, uh, we, yes, certainly. <laughs> There, there are a few members in the chat who are sharing their own um, favorite female patrons, which is lovely to see. Um, all right. Well, for my my, my last question is: uh, Does this does this presentation relate to an exhibition that we can hope to see at the Legion of Honor, or could you share with our members the best ways to see these works? Well, I think that you can see all these works on view. The Van Lows are actually in Gallery Seven, and the porcelains nearby in the little near the period rooms. But I think that as a team, we've really been investigating like wider lenses in which we can think about the collection and works that we've inherited. And somehow they're all together in 2021 right now. And the idea of looking at it through this lens of female patronage, I saw in a comment that Alma Spreckles founded the Legion. The Van Lowe's were acquired through the funds of Mildred Anna Williams. It's really kind of these women who have been the foundresses of the Legion and kind of been responsible for the collections we have today. And we've been looking at depictions of women, portraits in our collection, and trying to think of the biographies of these women. What are other depictions of them? What did they support in the arts? And it's been amazing to collaborate with Martin and Thomas to show that it's not just individually paintings, but that there's so much intersection between the decorative arts, sculpture, and painting, and that we can really holistically look at our collection together. Very special. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to sneak, I know I said that was the last question, but I'm gonna sneak one more in, very technical about porcelain um, because it just came in and it might be interesting to speak to, but regarding the vibrant colors and the pieces, were lead-based compounds used as colorants in this era? That's a question from John Barnhart. Oh. That might be a better question for Martin to answer. <laughs> well, uh, lead, um, uh, not so much, but I mean, where you get lead-based compounds is probably in the glaze um, rather than the color. So in the glaze is used, I think, the, because the colors are made out of oxides, uh, if I understand the basic um, uh, science here. So the lead component tends to come in the glaze. Fabulous. Well, thank you. We've surprised you with a technical question at the very end. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you, Thomas, for the fascinating presentation and for this discussion. It's been so nice to be able to be in conversation with you about um, this fabulous area of our collection. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.
Absolutely. And I'll also say on behalf of all of us here today, thank you so much to all of our members, not only for supporting the museums, but also for joining us here on Zoom this evening to talk about Madame de Pompadour. We always love hearing your feedback and we do our best to produce events that you will love and enjoy. So there will be a poll on your screen momentarily that you're welcome to fill out. Please take a moment to share your feedback on any future programming you might like to see from us. And we're very happy to share that the Legion of Honor will be reopening soon on Friday, May 7th, but members do get a sneak peek Wednesday, May 5th and Thursday, May 6th. So hopefully you will come to see our new exhibitions um, and of course the objects and paintings that we spoke about today. You'll have to make sure you take a look. T time tickets will be available for advanced reservations starting tomorrow. So they're not available yet, but tomorrow you can get online and get time tickets, or you can always email us at membership at famsf.org. Um, time tickets are required, and we do highly recommend booking in advance as we are still at reduced capacity for everyone's health and safety. I'd also like to share that tickets for Bouquets to Art, which takes place in June of this year, will go on sale beginning April 21st. That's at the De Young Museum, but I know it's much loved by our members, so I wanted to share those dates with you. Thank you again, Martin, Thomas, Isabella. Thank you to all of our members. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening, and thank you to our special events team behind the scenes for making this all possible. Have a great night.